kind of pushed record a little bit late on that, but it happens. It's okay. Hello, horror fiends, and welcome back to Guess What You're Wrong, the podcast where we dive deep into all things spooky, scary, and downright wrong. It's that time of year again, folks. The spooky season is upon us. And this year, we're sinking our teeth into the ultimate in vampire horror. No shimmering, sparkly, love-struck vampires here, though. Just bloodthirsty, terrifying creatures of the night. So get ready to be terrified, amused, and maybe even a little bit enlightened as we explore the good, the bad, and the downright ugly of the vampire horror genre. So buckle up, bonehead, because you're going for a ride. Enjoy the show! Now, before we get into this episode too far, I just got a little disclaimer here. First off, all audio used in this podcast is used under the protection of fair use. And as with all the movie reviews that I do here on Guess What? You're Wrong. We're going to spoil the hell out of every single thing we talk about. So, you have been warned. Kill me, Caleb Colton no longer belongs to our world. We give him a week to see if we can call him one of us. He belongs to hers. But you have to learn to kill. He belongs to theirs. I don't want to kill. He makes a kill tonight. And they all belong to the night. It's three hours short for a bus ticket home. You help me out? What are you on? Believe me. I told you. Just don't think of it as killing. Amen. 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 Don't think at all. It's just something that you do night after night. It's only ever a question of time. Nervous. I would be too if I were you. Near dark. The bigger boys fall in with control. Check out time. Watch yourself some time, son. Come on. Like damn, this is my family. Let him go. Dark. Ah! Pray for daylight. The night has its price. Hello and welcome back to another blood-sucking episode of Guess What? You're Wrong. And today, let me make sure there's music all the way off. Okay, today we are diving headfirst. In this, it's a, well, this is actually going to be coming out in October. So this will be the first episode for the spooky season. And uh, the guy I have on the line with me today to discuss this cinematic masterpiece is none other than, what's your name again? Uh, Bob. <laughs> Gilman Joel Roberts, from formerly from the Retro Movie Podcast. How you doing, Jill? Yeah, Joel. man. Uh, I, yeah. I didn't call you Jill. That's okay. Yeah. You could, so, I, yeah, my full, full name's Joel Robertson, but I've been called Joe Robinson Joel, Joel. I get Joel a lot. I, I, I guess it's a pronunciation thing. Some people say Joel. It's Joel, like Noel, or yeah, some people say Noel. Can, can we cuss in your podcast? I don't remember. Oh yeah. Okay. So or rhymes with asshole, whatever. You know. Uh, yeah. So I, I did hear you say the thing about your your ear balls and being here in Central Florida. Uh, my ear balls are rather sweaty. So Sweat. yeah, I bet you there's a lot of balls that are kind of sweaty. And probably. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's swamp ass is a thing here. Yeah. So we are going to dive uh, into actually, you know, but before that, Joel, mm-hmm. I haven't really talked to you for a bit. Yeah, it's what been a minute. On? What what you we got going on over there? Well, let's see. Um, we are we are in the process of doing all of our, all of our prep for Spooky Flicks Fest twenty twenty four. Retro movie. Geek. So Retro Movie Geek as an audio podcast is on a a bit of a hiatus, as it were, just because I got a little. It, it became a bit much to keep up with everything. And, and I felt like you could, you know, you could kind of tell when things are starting to slide off and you're like, you know, we used to do a very consistently an episode every two weeks. And then it's like, Oh, what a month. And then it's like, eh, when we get to it. So I was like, how about this? We're going to put a pause. Now I know Daryl 
and Peter have talked about doing like a retro TV geek yeah. thing. So yeah. I'm, I'm more or less putting that that that's in their <laughs> court. Um, but I am doing the mom and pop video shop. Every Monday we have a episode that comes out. Tyson, uh, my buddy and I, we do uh, like a, it's, we call them reviews with the recommendations more or less. I mean, I, I don't know that we've yet to cover a movie where we hated, <laughs> but I, what I want to try to do going into next year is I want him to pick the ones for me and me to pick the ones for him. So that way there's a, there's a, a much greater chance for conflict. <laughs> yeah, I, I can, I can get you some movies that you're probably not going to like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cause, cause I mean, most of it's, it's sort of the idea, like, you know, you came into the video shop on a Friday night, the, the clerk's not going to recommend something that they hated. They're going to recommend something that, you know, they probably like so. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, speaking of which, the movie we're covering today, I, I I can either confirm or deny my feelings on on this one. I guess I, I think you assumed I felt a certain way, so you invited me on for it. But we'll see. Oh, wait, oh yeah, I forgot. Yes. So yeah. on to the movie that we're actually yeah be discussing today. And for for the spooky season for October here, what we're going to be doing is doing vampire horror. Um, and there, there's a whole gambit. Oh yeah, excluding Twilight. That's not that's really not horror. you know it's vampires, not, not horror. Is it really vampires though? Yeah, it's vampires technically and werewolves. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a lot of them, but from what I understand, they have they do technically have vampires and werewolves. You saw Day of the Dolphin and you didn't watch Twilight? No. I think Twilight's probably better than Day of the Dolphin. But it probably is actually by yeah, more entertaining. I hate Twilight. Yeah. But anyway, we are uh diving. This is gonna be the first episode of October, so near dark. By recommendation of Joel. Now, I got to tell you, this is uh, from 1987, Near Dark. This is the first time I'd ever seen this. Really? Um, I remember, you know, the the cover of the case. It has. Um, is it this? Is this this one? The one that's on my shirt? Yeah, it's that one right there, uh, where it has Bill Paxton with his burnt Severin. Face. Yes, Severin. I have seen that picture in that box so many times. Oh yeah. And I'm always like, I, I want to watch that. I want to watch that. I want to check that out. And thanks to you. I, I was, no, no, I was going to try to, I, I was going to say, I have a movie that's like that for me that I, I can't find it now, of course. Normally it's, it's the Kindred. It's the one with, Ooh, that's good. you know which one I'm talking about? It's going to drive me crazy. I know it's back here somewhere. Anyway, I'm like, I'm going to break in my neck trying to find it. It's back there. But yeah, the Kindred is one of those where as I saw it, Every time I went to the video store, never rented it. I finally saw it just a few years ago. I actually liked it. I yeah. covered it on HMP a few years back, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get that. There's, there's a lot of movies like that, man. You couldn't see everything, and plus, if you're a kid like me, where you'd rent the same movie 85 times, you know that eats into your <laughs> other viewing. Yeah, yeah certainly does. Uh, now, this movie uh, it was directed by Catherine Bigelow, who yeah. is mar- who ended up marrying. James Cameron, right? Yeah. James Cameron. There you go. Yeah. I oh, think here. I think one of one of his five yeah. wives. Yeah. 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 <laughs> one of them. Uh written by Eric Red and Catherine Bigelow. Yeah, man. Stars. This it's dive this, this cast. Dude, it's aliens. It's the cast of aliens. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of the things I was reading was that it was made uh yeah. so soon after aliens. Yep. They were just like, Yeah, just use all them people. And yeah, I, so, I mean <laughs> It was. I was like, wait a minute. I was seeing him. Yeah, it's aliens. It's the cast from aliens. You know, we have. Uh, well, Caleb Colton. This is a. Uh, this guy's young here. Adrian Pastar. Yeah, heroes. That's the main thing I know him from. Besides yeah. this movie, is heroes. Yeah. That's save the cheerleader. Yeah, yeah. Save the cheerleader. Save the world. <laughs> oh yeah, not just save the cheerleader. That's right. You got to save the world too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Jenny Wright. She looks so familiar. You know, the only thing I know her from besides this movie off the top of my head, there was a Tales from the Crypt episode. And it's in the early 90s. Like, I think it was the one, and I don't want to give anything away, but it involves like a logger. And and I remember somebody in, in getting stuck inside a tree and them cutting it. I, uh, I they had that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that, and I'm pretty sure it's her. It's like one of those where somebody's having an affair or some, you know, typical Tales from the Crypt kind of. She, she was in St. Elmo's Fire. Oh, okay. And she was in Twister. That's where I remember her from because I just recently watched Twister. The the, the ninety six one with Bill Paxton. Yeah, who was she in that? Eighty nine. It says she plays Stephanie. Oh. Um. Oh no. I. Uh, correction. This okay. is where I remember her from. Young Guns two. Okay. Yeah. She's the, she's the uh, one that owns the brothel that ends up 
taking off all her clothes and gets on the horse and says, you can kiss my lily white ass. Okay. Oh, yeah. She walks big, out. Big oh, a lawnmower man. She was a lawnmower, lawnmower man. man. Yep. Jeez. That's where I recognize her from. She's, she's cute. I oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah she's, she's cute. cute but she's no. You know what's funny? I was looking through her IMDb and I don't see that she was in Tales from the Crypt. So I must be thinking she's somebody else. Because <laughs> I could have sworn that there was a Tales from the Crypt that she was in. But I'll be darned you can't find it. <laughs> if I could find it. Yeah. Well, there you go. So I stand corrected. But unless IMDb is wrong, which is totally impossible. They're never wrong. Yeah. IMDb is like, they're like all correct all the time, aren't they? Yeah. They're like, they're like, they're like Wikipedia. They are never wrong. So that's, correct. That's, that was sarcasm in case it wasn't clear. <laughs> and of course, we have Lance Hendrickson. Oh, buddy. Dude, this guy. I mean, we could go on. He's got how many credits does he even have? I mean, he's got a lot of actor credits, 268. A lot. Yeah. Um, most memorable from was Aliens. I mean, Alien, Aliens, right? That uh, he played uh, the they Android. No, he didn't he didn't play in no, Alien. Was, yeah. Not an alien. He was no alien. aliens. Yeah, he was Bishop. No, he played Bishop. Yep. I mean, that's oh and Pumpkinhead, Ed Harley. Pumpkinhead, where's Peter at? We need him. I know. Yeah, exactly. Where's Pumpkinhead Peter? Probably probably working. <laughs> well, actually, no, not now. He's home by now. I he's, I know he's five to six hours ahead of me. I, I oh, yeah. I keep track of his uh on his Facebook. Yeah. Man. I miss hearing all you guys together. Yeah. yeah. I do too. And that's what's great about doing a spooky flicks fest is we all get to be uh, together for several episodes, yeah. which is nice. I know. Yeah. And I did sign up. Dude. I don't want to dive into that right now. Okay. The movie I picked for Spooky Flicks Fest. Yeah. I love that movie. Okay, cool. When I saw it on there, I was like, hell yeah. I try, I don't, honestly, if I had to have to go back and look at the list to even know which one it was. <laughs> we can talk about it later if you want to. Without warning. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the alien one, right? Oh, yeah. That, okay, yeah. With the little flying discs. Oh, yeah. Yep. I like to call them the, my, the flying alien vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so back to Bill Paxton as Severin, as you were saying. Dude, he's Bill so Bill Paxton good. is, he's one of those actors that, I, I, no matter what he's in, you know, you go back to uh, Weird Science, mm -hmm. you know, you're just like, he has that, you, you recognize it, you recognize that voice, and it doesn't matter what character he plays, yep. it, it always comes across as the same, kind of like a Keanu Reeves kind of thing, it doesn't matter if he's a different character, he always is the same character. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, Tyson and I were discussing this recently, and he made a point that I never thought about. It was like, especially with the character he plays in this one, he could he could have gone the same route as like a Nick Cage. Like he has that Nicolas Cage energy, the way, yeah. you know, could you imagine Nicolas Cage playing Severin? It totally would work. It's that same like, you know, finger licking good when he's <laughs> dur during that scene. And if you know, you know. Yeah, the um, he's been in all kinds of movies. You know, he's been Agents of Shield, mm -hmm. a couple, a couple episodes of Colony. You've seen Frailty, Alien. right? You've seen Frailty, right? Frailty, I, dude, I love Frailty. That's the only movie he ever directed, to my knowledge. It's, really? Yeah, he directed it. It yeah. was like because he passed away what twenty sixteen, something yeah, like that. I think it was somewhere like that. Did you guys cover one of his movies before he passed away? <sighs> we I hope not. Well, no, oh, you mean like right before, like the curse? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I cannot be blamed. I am not taking responsibility for the death of the great Bill Paxton. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, moving on, we have Jeanette Goldstein plays Diamondback, and of course we know her Vasquez. from yeah, yeah, Vasquez. Yeah, Vasquez. Yeah. Um, I remember when I when I was watching this because I had no idea um, going into this that this was basically Aliens cast. Yeah. So I'm watching. I'm like. Why do I know all these people? <laughs> I'm like, these guys, that looks familiar. And then when I saw her, I'm like, yeah, I had to look it up. And I'm like, yeah, that's Vasquez. Yeah. So, yeah. And also uh, Lethal Weapon 2. If memory serves, isn't she the cop when they're, remember, because they're, they were two, they're setting up all the booby traps for the cops to kill them off one by one. And she's on the diving board. Remember the diving board? And she gets on yeah. the, hey, boo, 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 you actually see the stunt woman's body just <laughs> flipping through the air. And she also played, uh, Edward Furlong's foster mother. Oh, yeah, of course. In, G2. Yeah, G2. G2. yeah, yep. One of the best movies of all time. Yeah, I would agree with that. I saw it. I saw that 11 times in the theater. I think it was 11. Nice. 
yeah. I remember when uh, my sister, who's she's an adult and got kids and everything now, but when she was a little boy, I, I remember how old she was, but I took her to see T2. Uh-huh. She had been, I don't know, 10 years old. Yeah. And we saw that at the movie theater, and I was just, I was, yeah, she loved it. Now she loves it. It was great. Oh, yeah. It's such a great movie. Actually, it was it was playing. Um, we have a. I, I don't know if it's you have this in your neck of the woods, but flashback cinema where they'll, you know, for like a weekend they'll bring back an old movie, and they brought T two back a few months ago, and I took my kid. My kids had seen it before, but never on the big screen. Yeah. So technically, I've seen it on the big screen twelve times <laughs> because we saw it again. So there you go. Now we we just moved from North Carolina, and when we lived at North Carolina, my son was a manager at the local theater. It's a small little. Yeah, it's not, it's not like an AMC chain or nothing like that. You know, it's a small little, little mom and pop. Theater. Yeah, and uh, they had always having they have uh, way back Wednesdays where they'd bring back all oh, these old cool. movies. Um, and I knew the general manager there. I was good friends with him. And actually, I got some. He's a movie maker, and I got some of his movies. I want to send to you. Oh, cool! Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're up there, and uh, he had gotten his hands on a bunch of thirty-five millimeter prints of different movies. So we did. I think it was Evil Dead 2. Nice. Um, 35 millimeter print. And we got to watch nice. it on the big screen. That's dude. awesome, dude. Yeah, it, it's amazing. I don't care what you ever was like, oh, the old movie theaters. It is a different experience. I've seen Halloween. If I've seen it once, I've seen it 500 times. Yeah. I watched it on the big screen for the first time before the, the newer Halloween movies came out. They did like a revival and had it you know, out. I'd never seen it on the big screen before. And I felt on some level like it was a different movie. There was things I noticed I had never noticed before. With Michael in the background, it's like yeah. I, I always knew he was in certain moments and shot, but it's like it was so glaringly obvious to me now by seeing it on the big screen. Totally same with Alien and Jaws, seeing those on the big screen, totally different experience. And and to see it on a thirty-five millimeter, thirty-five millimeter print version, yeah, yeah, yeah. over yeah. grainy and it still oh, has, yeah, big, man, I love you know, it. The cracks oh, and pops, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, when we were there was one spot in the Evil Dead where. When you watch it now, you they have the moon off to the side, mm -hmm. and it looks good and everything like that. But in a thirty-five millimeter print, you can tell that they, they just pasted a moon there because it's like <laughs> you it's see like the mat, you can see the mat around yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, they redid that good. I mean, it, it, it's stuff like that when you watch these old movies like that. It's just I'm loving it, and I yeah, I don't want to. I can go off on a tangent on that. <laughs> so get, uh, All right, because the next one we have in line is Mister. Jack Death himself. Oh, buddy. Tim Thomerson. Tim Thomerson. Dude. So I, I have a confession to make. So first off, Tim Thomerson is one of my all-time favorite act, like character actors that never... Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like I love that he was in all that full movie stuff. Transfers. I love all the Transfers movies. Yeah. Um, Doll Man. Doll Man versus Demonic Poise. <laughs> Uncommon Valor. Iron Eagle. He's he's Jason Gedrick's dad in Iron yeah. Eagle. I, 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 Tim Thomerson is one of those dudes who, whenever he shows up, I'm immediately happy. Like I'm just yeah. immediately happy. And um, I don't want to give anything away yeah. yet, but to tie it into us doing this today for, for one of our mom and pop video shop recommendations, I may or may not have uh, done some near dark talk so that I could make sure I gave the show a shout out, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, and I realized I went through the whole freaking thing, dude. And I forgot Tim Thomerson. I'm like, how is that even <laughs> possible get Tim i don't have a clue bro and, and the worst part was is we also were going to do a fade to black which I, I don't know if you've ever seen that from 1980 um and tim Robertson's in that as well it, it's a fairly small part but he has he's in that um uh, i mean well, it's not a small part it's a supporting role but it's not like the main character and um to me that was one of the best things about the movie was that yeah. tim Robertson was in it and so i just seen that like i had it fresh on the mind and yet i completely so i ended up having to do like a post sort of like a post end of the episode i'm up to tag yeah. on I'm a moron. How did I forget this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I was. So, I'm always happy to see Tim. And I, he's got like a little bit of an accent, and does he? But he puts a bit of that like Texas twang yeah. on it. Oh yeah, and he, he is one of those. When I first saw him in this, I was just like, ah. Oh. And he does. It brings a smile to your face because yeah. the memories. I have so many good memories of, of, the, of the Full Moon movies with him. Yeah, yep. all the Jack Deaths, like you had mentioned them, all the transfers and everything. I love those shows. Yeah, they're great, man. You know, and. I'm like, man, now it's like when I saw him in this, I'm like, you know what? I need to go back and watch some of these movies because yeah. it's been a while since I've seen all the transfers. Oh, and yeah. Those are great movies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would actually, I was going to cover the original transfers here recently, but I didn't have time to watch it. I want to make sure I rewatch it. Plus, I wanted to watch it with my kids because they haven't seen it. Um, yeah. 
I recently showed them uh, Eliminators, that's, which is technically Empire, which I guess Transfers was Empire. I mean, Empire became Full Moon, I know. But yeah. uh, but but oh, yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen Eliminators with the Mandroid. I it's, think so. It, okay, yeah. It, it, I, I literally, you probably can't see it from here. I have the poster right above me. It's. I'll show you, I'll send you a clip of the poster, so, or the, yeah. an image of the poster. It's awesome. I love it. It is bonkers. <laughs> it is just a bonkers okay. movie. I want to check that out. Well, actually, there, well, well, well I, I'm just going to go. Hold on. Here we go. It's that poster. I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, right. Yeah, a little bit there. It yeah. Yeah, that's it. Oh, nice. Now come back down with it. There we go. Full Moon, full Moon used to, I don't, are they, they're still making movies, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They have a, there's a Full Moon streaming channel, and I do know that they do still put stuff out. Yeah. They there's some new really, Puppet Masters that came out not long ago. Like the last couple years. They just came out. Yeah. Um, Radu, I used to love the subspecies movie. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, there was. Yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to subscribe to that full moon streaming because mm-hmm. I love those. Oh, I love yeah, those. They're, they're fun, man. They're just fun. Yeah, they're great, great fun. Um, and next in line, we have Joshua John Miller Homer. Yeah, this do kid. You, do you first off, before you get into it, do you know who he is though? Who he's related to? No. Uh, you ready? Uh, uh, hold on, let me think. Yeah. See if you can figure it out. I know. His dad and his brother, his half brother. Yeah. There. Yeah, I know. Um, I can't remember. I'm not okay. So his dad, and anybody who knows who his dad's other son is, will know who figure it out. But his yep. dad is Jason Miller, uh, father Karis in The Exorcist. Yep. And his half brother is Jason Patrick. Jason Patrick. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Cool. Michael. Yeah. Michael from uh, Lost Boys, which is funny because that came out the yep. same year as this, and that movie did exceedingly well. Whereas financially, I don't think this one did nearly as well. <laughs> Lost yeah, Boys. not nearly as well. What did I don't even remember what the you know what the budget was on this? On this, it was in and obviously it, it was obviously millions. I I don't think it was super high. Uh, uh according the, to the, I, the bus says five million. Wow, that's, that's actually million. that's not but see a gross worldwide three point three million. Yeah, and and I think Lost Boys definitely had a higher budget and it did a uh, lot better. Lost Boys did a lot better. Lost Boys, another movie that actually make, actually covering. Uh, nice. in October. And I love Lost Boys, but not to give anything away, but let me just put it this way. Uh, Near Dark is probably my, it is my favorite vampire movie of all time. Like, really? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd rather watch Near Dark than almost. It's got that tangerine, and I'm sure you get into it, but like the score. And, yeah. Just, and I, and I, I love that they never say the word vampire. Yeah. Not one time. It's like, it's it feels kind of more grounded in like a, you know, it's just well, like a, a thing. <laughs> they, they've completely, I mean, there, there's some other cast in here, you know, Mar- Marcy Leeds, mm-hmm. Kenny Call. I mean, we can go down to the, I know Peter would like the second boom yeah, mic. The, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the best grips, uncles, aunts, cousin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, so let's get into the, let's get into the, the, the meat of the movie. Then. Yes. You know, um, which, which, by the way, I've got my, my two disc, DVD oh, wow. set, which actually it's a really cool set, and they don't and they're not super. It obviously obviously a used one. It's they're not super expensive. It comes with like a little booklet. Oh nice. There. Oh, by the way, you know what else he? Uh, so Joshua Miller not only does he have famous sibling and dad, um, he's also I guess gotten into screenwriting, and that new movie The Exorcist that just came out with Russell yeah. Crowe, he wrote that. Oh really? And but he wrote another, which I haven't seen it. I've heard it's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or the was it called The Exorcism? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right. It would be called The Exorcist. Duh. <laughs> but, but no. The um, the one he wrote, I was blown away. Was a freaking Final Girls from 2015. You remember that one about the the girl who like goes? It's like she her mom was a famous scream queen and died, and she ends up ending up going back to the 80s with her friends, and they're like kind of caught yeah. in that that slasher scenario, and her yeah. mom's. There. You remember that one? It was so yeah. freaking good. Like it was shockingly good. Yeah, he wrote that. Oh. Huh. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't either. And um, apparently, just so you know, I looked it up. Lost Boys actually, I mean, I say only had an eight million dollar budget. So it wasn't like a you know, crazy amount more than this one. And it made thirty five million dollars throughout its run. And it made five million its opening weekend, whereas this thing only made like six hundred thousand. So that so now what do you what would you owe that to? You think I mean, was this around that time frame? Because this was a De Laurentis. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't. Did he produce it? Hold on, I'm looking. I don't see wasn't his a, name. Wasn't a DEG? It's, no, I don't see DEG. I know it was 
Studio Canal. I don't know what studio, like, I, I, I didn't check that before I jumped on. I don't think it was direct Taylor, just though I could be wrong. Um, I think my personal feeling of why it didn't do as well is because the, so this came out in January, according to, to it's actually said January, wait, it's weird. Why did it say January of 88? This is an 87 movie. Maybe it didn't have like a wide release until December. I mean, maybe till January and it came out in December and then. I'm not sure. January 88 in the United Kingdom. Oh, maybe that's what it. Okay, you're right. I didn't see the United Kingdom part. It's it was a October 4th of 87. So you think this come out freaking in the in October like that? Whereas Lost Boys came out. Let's see, August. So I okay, it could be one thing. August. So Lost Boys came out before this by a couple months, right? Yep. So you already had people saw Lost Boys. Lost Boys also is. Like they tie, they tapped in beautifully to the whole just time with the way they were dressed. You had these guys who were basically big movie stars to that teen yeah. crowd. Like Hubert, Hubert Sutherland hadn't got like a like gotten huge, huge yet, but Stand by Me had come out the year before that. I'm trying to think what else he had been in around that. It would, I mean, this is relatively early on for him. Uh, but Jason Patrick, I feel like was had been in some things. I it just it feels very much like a teen horror flick that would have been really popular in the place you had the soundtrack um whereas this movie is almost more of like this slow paced western vibe yeah. and, and it just it feels almost like an art film at times and even though you had the cast half the cast of aliens in it and i don't know how much they milked that in the marketing i just think that 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 might have been one of the reasons why. Maybe there's other reasons. People out there watching this note might know the reasons better than I would, but I feel like that's my guess. It was a combination of Lost Boys beat it to market, yep. and and then you think maybe that would prime people, right? They'd be like, oh, I want to see another vampire flick. But I think it's because this is so different. This does have like a dark. It's also a lot darker than Lost Boys. Like it's yeah, it's I mean, definitely got a much darker tone and edge to it, despite the ending, which we can get into if you want to. I don't know, I don't know how spoilery you want to get, but uh, spoil the hell out of everything we yeah. talk about. Uh, good <laughs> so, yeah it's a, i mean this for me i mean i I knew it was a vampire movie mm -hmm. um but it's completely rewriting like what a vampire is the only thing that they have in common with other vampires is the sunlight deal you know i you know i even think uh uh what's his name jesse he, his guns i think have a cross on the handle mm. or on the grip or something like that so I mean, the only thing yeah. really there's no fangs, nope. You know, there's nothing. In it. They're feral. It's what I like. You know, what? that's what it is. I like that idea of like feral people. So like hills have eyes, yep. you know, or the, like where you got people who are so outside of society and and just what the 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 norm and status quo. And obviously, you know, they're obviously homeless. They live out of this RV, yeah. and and they're just surviving. But I love that they're a family and they really seem to care about each other and they still mess with each other like Severin and Homer, like all the crap that, yeah. you know, and, and I just I love that. I, by the way, one of my favorite lines uh, uh, since you said we're spoiling stuff is when it's actually on the on the box when um, Lance Hendrickson's Jesse says, let's just say how he's, he's asked how old he is. Oh, right, yeah. I can't let me goes, let's just say I fought for the South. And he kind of gets that that Hendrickson smirk. He goes, we lost. <laughs> it's so perfect. It's so friggin' perfect, man. And that's what I love. It's like the writing is so good because Eric Red did The Hitcher. And freaking dude, yeah. The Hitcher is one of my all-time favorite just anything. It's probably my favorite of that subgenre, which is one of my absolute favorite subgenres, which is the you know highway horror that you know yeah. you're on a on a on a stretch of road and you got to deal with the killer or the psycho or the the vehicle or whatever it is um and the hitcher the more i see it the more i like it and much like this movie it has that really dark dark element and tone to it and eric red was sort of notorious everything he wrote and directed was like that um and uh yeah i just i think the writing in this is so good because again they don't overdo it with exposition Right. There's not a lot of explaining why they are the way they are, why they can like we don't get a big speech of like yeah. why they could go into the sun. They, even the ending with the blood transfusion, they don't ever explain that. It, I guess it kind of makes sense. I feel like it's a little cop out. What? You know, it's a bit of a cop out that, that it's like gives it this happy ending that I don't know that the movie needed to have. I kind of felt like it should have been a darker ending. Yeah, the uh 
that ending with the the blood transfusion actually curing them was kind of odd. I was like, I was thinking to myself, if that's as easy as it is to yeah. cure somebody of vampirism, how come everybody's not doing it? Yeah, and I think that's the thing. You know? They never talk about vampires. Like they never yeah. say they, they just say daddy, uh, you know, uh, you know, they might say I think somebody may refer to them as monsters, but they don't ever say that word. It's always like yeah. in their universe, vampires exist, but they don't have this awareness of like the the iconic pop culture references or any of that crap. They're just people surviving yeah. and the way they can and I think and look, I don't know in 87, like it became a, a bit of a trope that vampirism especially was either meant to be symbolic for AIDS or drug addiction. Like that became the two things that I think they like, especially once you get into the nineties. Yeah. Cause because of the blood, the blood factor. And because yeah. that idea of being addicted to, you know, and it, and it, and it, and it starts to cause you to have to live on the, on the edges of society. And but you know, there, there are, I get, I get it, but I, and I don't know in 87 because you did have, obviously AIDS was a thing, obviously drug addictions always been a thing so i think you could make the argument that in near dark it was meant to be about that and that because you think about the blood transfusion right like you know yeah. there are parallels you could but i feel like i don't know if they were thinking about that when they wrote the movie you know what i mean like i feel like because the movie was probably written a few years before and so yes aids was around but it wasn't i think the degree that it would become you know yeah, you just went deep on me there. I'm sorry. I do that every once in a while. I have like a, I, I have like a brain fart that happens. <laughs> Wasn't thinking about that, but you, it makes sense now. But anyways, I don't. I feel like I. I always. You know what I hate? I hate when people do that and they act like that was a guarantee. Like that. Yeah, that's what they were going for. You don't know. My yeah. guess is Eric Red's like. You know what would be badass? It's a freaking vampire movie set in the West. Like it's a Western and you know, it's like a set on the highway kind of horror flick, but we never mentioned vampire yeah. because that's how I would approach it. And if people, I love the George Lucas attitude when they would ask him like, Oh, were you, what were you trying to say with this? He goes, I, I, I know what I was trying to say, but I'd rather you determine it for yourself. You know what I mean? I, I, pro, I, I like that approach better. I'm not going to tell yeah. you what to think, think for yourself. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, and when this, Seeing Caleb here, we're going to jump into something here yeah. real quick. Um, Adrian Pastor, when he, when he, the first time they show him, you know, he's just a cowboy and everything, like that, and, he, and he sees uh, May, and you know, because he's sitting down like in a restaurant or something, he's like, no, I'm going to, he sees her, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to go talk to this girl. Yeah. yeah. And he just walks right up and it's just like, it, it to me, it, it it started off a little. I think I think that aspect for me was a little clunky, mm -hmm. um, you know, because he just walks up to this girl, mm -hmm. and out of nowhere, you know, she's going off on on some trip with them, and you know, they're yeah, making looking at horses and stuff. I could see why you'd feel that way. I've seen this movie more than once, obviously. <laughs> so um, I, I think so. Rewatching it this time, especially. So when he goes, I think if memory serves and correct me if I'm wrong, that he goes up, it's and it's very I I, I you're I don't know, you I know you you're from Florida like me, or you're 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 are you originally from Florida? I can't remember. No, I know you, no. I, that's right. No, you're not. But you've lived in and around smaller towns, I assume. Yeah. Okay. So me too. And I'm in a small town now. Yeah, well, and, and that that's sort of, and maybe it was more indicative back then than they do it today, but I remember like teenagers just going in and hanging out in parking lots. Yeah. Or like, and I think he goes up to like a into the convenience store or liquor stores. It's like a little strip mall, yeah. and he's got a couple of buddies there, and he starts kind of you know drawing with them, and and you know typical like guys being guys kind of BS, and they see this pretty girl, and the one guy notices, and I think I always took that as Caleb is like more or less just trying to, like you know he thinks he's the alpha, he thinks he's the the guy that, and you let's be frank, Adrian Pestar is not an ugly dude, so yeah. I imagine a guy like him probably does get a lot of the ladies to notice him. He sees this woman. She's, by the way, very um, not so subtly uh, um, with an ice cream cone. So obviously, there's a potential <laughs> sexual yeah. thing. That. And you know, it, it's night, and she's sitting there. And if you pay attention to the dialogue, this is what I love about it. I never noticed this before this viewing, but he says, um, "Oh, he says something about hey, you know, about her ice cream cone." And and I think he says something. Hey, can I have a bite 
and she kind of pauses, right? And then, a, and a little, mo mo a few moments later, he, she, you know, something like, "Hey, would it kill you?" It's, it's like, "Would it kill you to like they?" You can really pay attention. They're totally setting up just through their dialogue, oh, all yeah. the little nods to her biting him, killing him. Like it's all right there, boom, boom, boom. But it's very subtle. It's just these two kids, and look, she's very hmm. pretty, you know, mysterious, and that becomes the challenge of. You know, hey, can I get this girl to go with me and show my friends off? You know that that I got yeah. this girl, and so I, I think it's. I think I always took it as it's meant to be. The whole movie almost feels like a dream. You know what I mean? It, 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 at times, it feels it has this like not dream logic necessarily. Like you watch like a David Lynch movie, and it's like dream logic where you're like, why, what, what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> why, why did this character? Do? Nobody would do that. But then if you go into a go, okay, it's a David Lynch movie. That's why. Um, but this movie, it, everything makes sense, but the way people interact is a little otherworldly, which they are vampires, yeah. so it makes sense to me. And I feel like it's one of those, the more you watch it, the more you start to notice things in it that you might not have noticed the first time, and your appreciation will grow. i have to watch that again. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that got me was was that group dynamic within, within the family. The vampires. Yeah, yeah, the family. Yeah. You know how, you know, even you know, Homer, he supposedly is like old. Yeah. He's, he's like 12 or 13. Yeah, he's in a kid's body. Yeah. And that's it. There's one part where, you know, when uh, the gunfight, mm -hmm. where he starts screaming and say, no. And they tell him, shut up, old man. Yeah. And I was like, that's kind of cool. You know? Yeah. Because the way he's acting too, right? Because he yeah. acts like a kid. Even yeah. though he, and they were, yeah, they referred to him as old man, I think a couple different times, but that, especially that scene. And then there's a part two, and, and I, I'm going to keep using this because they have like lots of quotes all over the box. But there's a great quote that when Severin, and it's early on when they get Caleb, and you get the vibe that he turned May. He, he made her into yeah. a vampire for himself. Yeah, they, I think they himself. tell, yeah, they tell that. Yeah. And, and, and so, uh, and, and, and so Homer, this 12 or 13 year old, kid on the outside says have any idea what it's like to be a big man on the inside and have a small body on the outside you know they they, they oh. like and, and you think about it that is pretty horrifying it's sort of like that's i know the in interview with the vampire they did that too with kirsten dunn's character yeah. right the idea that yeah you age but you always look like a child so you know and, and unless somebody's you know let's yeah why well, i don't want to get you demonetized or whatnot but let's just say um uh, 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 uh kids, yeah, yeah. A, a PD, oh, I've heard people say PDF file. Um, <laughs> that, that, uh, uh, yeah, that's so, and, that, and so, so that's I think I, there's been a lot, a lot worse things said on this, but okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but I, I think what was interesting is like later on, and I won't say who it is unless you, you want to go there. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay, so they, they end up, and this is probably the most contrived moment in the whole movie for me, aside from the, the blood transfusion. Is they end up at a motel at the end. Now, the whole time Caleb's father, played by Tim Thomerson, and his young sister have been looking for him. Yeah. And they end up basically all at the same motel. Now, it's a wild contrivance. It, it, it's I get why they had to do it because they needed everybody to they need to give Caleb a reason to to fight uh and all that. So I accept it. But at, it, at that point, at, at that point, he had kind of given in to them. Oh yeah, like he's he's basically you get the vibe. He's planning on sticking around, like yeah. and he's gonna just become a full vampire. I mean, that's what's that's cool. Is they, this is one of the first movies that I could think of where that whole idea of somebody becoming a vampire by killing, right? You have to kill to become the vampire and 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 make your first kill and drink blood yeah. to go full vampire, mm -hmm. and that he can't do it. Like that idea of like he's still enough of a human in there. There's enough of a soul that he can't go there, and so he has to keep feeding on May. Well. As they're there, there's just, you know, the Homer is out like getting, you know, whatever, you know, doing what doing his thing in the middle of the night. And this little girl is getting ice at the motel, like yeah. like you like you do. And it's turns out it's uh Caleb's sister. Now what's hilarious is I think it's because they don't show her and the dad for a while, even though that's not a long movie, it's like what an hour and 40 minutes, something like that. Yeah. Um I for, I always forget that it's Caleb's sister <laughs> for whatever I, reason. I gotta tell you, when I first saw it. I didn't realize that. Yeah, you forget at first. You're kind of like, oh, so you think it's going to kill her. When they, put, when they put them together, Caleb yeah. and her in the room, and I was like, you're like oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Especially once he reacts to her. They're like, oh, crap, that's right. That's a sister. Yeah. But then, but what's cool about that is you could make the argument. It it does drop your guard, and you think, oh, crap, he's going to kill this little kid. And then he brings her in, and, and, he, and what makes this kind of creepy on a different is in real life, 
Joshua Miller was, I think, 12 or 13. I mean, she looks, he's one of those kids that yeah. feels way older than he actually was. And he's like 12 to 13 years old in real life. And the little girl is still like pretty young. I'm mean, sure like nine or 10, maybe, maybe 11, but relative to him, not that much. But because they've established him as the old man and he's talking about how he wants to keep her and you know he doesn't just mean to feed. <laughs> yeah. you know, he wants this basically to be his girlfriend. Yeah. And the whole thing just feels... Crap. It, but it's never they never fully go there, but it's creepy. Like the whole thing is just so creepy. And, and uh, but then that op- opens it up to where Caleb now is going to fight them because they're not going to let he's not going to let them kill his dad and sister, um, even though he's willing to go with them. He's that's a bridge too far for him, which makes sense. He look, I'm trying to figure out what else he was in because he looks he looks very Joshua familiar. Miller. Yeah. Okay, there's one movie I know from that era that I absolutely love. Do you ever see River's Edge with Crispin Glover? Yes. Keanu Reeves. Remember that really dark one about they find the girl's body or the, the girl? I, I don't give So a girl is dead and she's naked on the side of River's Edge. And I think it was actually based on a true story. And I know Keanu Reeves is in it, but it's like pre Bill and Ted, Keanu Reeves. Yeah, the kid is in that. Yeah, yeah he's okay. in that. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a, great movie. That's a yeah. great movie. It's dark, though. That is a dark movie. Dark. Yeah. But yeah. and I think that came out like in '86, maybe it was like right around this time. Yeah, yeah. And no. he, he was in a lot of stuff all the way into the early '90s, and then he just kind of disappears. disappears. Yeah, you know the uh, the dynamic between um, Severin and Caleb. Yeah, you know how. Yes. Right at first, you know he's what, what is what does he say? I want to dance on on his face or something like that oh yeah 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 do, yeah, do something to his to his skull or something yeah dance on. Yeah. and that's when may gets in the way but there's always throughout the throughout the movie there is that you know dynamic with caleb and severin yeah. you know when 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 caleb saves them yes you know at the bar you know and, and so on and even at the end you know when uh when in caleb's escaping in the, in the semi yeah and Severin's just punching into this semi, pulling stuff out. Yeah, I do, do. so what movie did that totally remind you of? The Terminator. Yeah, t- totally. I, I thought, and I don't know if that was a part because I you, James Cameron does not have a credit. I don't think in this movie, even as yeah. a producer, I, you that one scene and sequence makes me wonder, like, if he just told Catherine Bigelow, like, "Hey, I got this. I I got this thing. I had this fetish for trucks because I drove one for so long." Uh, I guess the one thing I'll give Cameron is he actually came from like a working background, working class background. Like he wasn't, you know, one of these guys who grew up with like, to my knowledge, I don't think he was. I, I've always ever, I've always heard he's like a truck driver. And yeah, you kind of wonder there's a party that goes, I want to look in that a little further and make sure it's just not one of these stories because you wanted to seem like one of the regular folks, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> you always kind of, but I have heard that about him, that he's just, he was a truck driver. I know he's married. His first wife, I think was a waitress, which is why Sarah Connor is a waitress, yeah. but that whole sequence was severed on the truck and yeah, rip it. It's so, tr- and just even the way he's dressed, he's got the jacket on the half of his face is all truck, which is, yeah. This image is very Terminator, yeah. Which I kind—I still love it. I mean, it's awesome. And the other thing I love is this movie helps prove yet again for me why CGI is fine to enhance things, but when you over rely on it, it completely changes the dynamic of how a movie is paced, blocked, everything. It yep. it changes the whole dynamic of storytelling. And here's why: so there's a moment where after that fight. Um, actually, maybe is it before the semi shows up, or I think it's after he gets him out of the semi, definitely before it explodes. Explodes, um, where because it does explode, right? I'm not imagining, yeah. I'm not, I'm not complaining yeah, that with Terminator, okay? Yeah, I thought it did. Um, uh, and 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 Severin grabs Caleb and throws him. Oh, yeah, this you know is talking right. about yeah, this and, is after he got his transfusion and she, he was back to human. That's right, so he's come back to save May. That's right, yeah, yeah. and so. He grabs him and he throws him. And it's like there's this, and the way it, you, the way they cut it is you see Severin grab him close up. You see Caleb's face, and then up oh, he goes out kind of like that move, and you probably threw his body up. And then they cut to the shot like 50 yards away from Severin on the other on the other end of the road at a really low angle. Like the camera's on the ground. And all of a sudden, Caleb, like the front half of him falls right into frame as the, and, you, and they had the sound effect of him hitting, right? Okay. Which you know he was probably just out of frame and he just fell over, right? Yeah. If they had done that today with CGI yeah. for modern audiences, they would have felt the freaking need to throw show him 
flying what? through the air, swimming around, uh, crash, rolling, uh, and it would have looked animated as hell, and it would have yeah. looked stupid. And and what the way Catherine Bigelow shot it, and the way because they had to because they didn't have any other options, they had no budget, so you have to work. It's what forces you to be creative. Like to me, what CGI has done, it's the same problem as when you give somebody three hundred million dollars to make something. There's no need to be that creative. You could just throw freaking money at it. You could throw CGI at it. Oh, so we'll fix it with CGI. No, man, be creative. It's about the pacing. And because of that, in my head, I always had this image that you do see him fly, but you don't. It allows me to fill the gaps in. And that's one of the things I love about this movie is that you have to fill in some of the gaps. And that's where, you know, I was just talking to my son about this earlier. You know, that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed reading so much. Mm -hmm. Um, because you make those, yeah, your imagination it makes that movie. It's yep. the same thing. You you don't actually see these things happening off screen, <laughs> but you do in your head. A great example of this, and it goes without saying, is the original te- Chainsaw Massacre. Like Texas Chainsaw oh. Massacre, there's no, almost no blood in that movie. I'd argue there may, I mean, it's at least equivalent to freaking Halloween with no blood. Like there's uh, there's almost no blood in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But everybody, especially if they've only seen it one time. They're always convinced it's a super gory movie. It's like, no, it's not. Because Toby Hooper, God bless him, was trying to make a PG movie. So he intentionally shot it thinking, oh, if we don't show these things. But as a result, it enhanced because your imagination. See, here's the Yeah, exactly. See, I'm of this crazy old school belief system that the human imagination is so much more powerful than what any stupid ass machine can make you think. It, you're like, oh, we're going to show them what we want them to see. No, man, let them think they saw something. That is so much worth the uh, her. I, I, in hindsight, I, I, I haven't rewatched Hereditary since it came out because it bugged me so much. But I also kind of wonder if, like, I it's one of those movies that people built it up to the degree that they did. And you kind of would go back to, like, eh, on, on rewatch. I don't know. I don't know how many times you've seen it, but my point is there's a scene in it, the yeah, scene. Yeah. And I covered that movie about a year ago, I think, on the podcast. Yeah. And, it, and that, that I saw when it first came out. Yeah, and I hadn't seen it since. Mm-hmm. I completely forgot about that scene. Yeah, and then I, when I was rewatching it, I was like, "But you never see it happen. Yeah, you never see any way, and because you never see it happen, and then it followed up for like it feels like forever of like eight minutes of Tony Collette screaming and crying and just breaking down. Which let's be frank, if you rolled up under your car and found that, how horrific under- that shit would! Oh my god." And so, but you never see anything. You don't see the car. You don't, you literally, until that last shot in the road. I see the head. Yeah, you just, it it amplifies it because you didn't see the stuff that led up to that. That's the brilliance of it is what you didn't freaking see. And he could have easily showed all of it. He could have showed all of it. It wouldn't have been effective. It would not have been remotely as effective as it was. You're right. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, you're right. You don't actually, you don't actually see. You see her with her head out the window, and you see the pole coming, and that's it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, like, that's like for instance, it's Child's Play. The reason why Child's Play is shot partially the way it's shot is because you got to hide cables, right? You got to hide cables. Oh, yeah. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta build your your set of their apartment with furniture that's way too big, so that when the little person acting is Chucky in the background of focus with my, it looks proportional. Yeah. Nowadays, they, I mean, now to be fair, I gotta say they probably would because the people behind, I think, Child's Play by and large still I love practical effects. So they do it on purpose. But I feel like if you just handed that over to a lot of studios or somebody who didn't really care that much, they would just CGI them. Just see. But the problem is, is it's not just that you've CGI'd Chucky that's the problem. It's that it changes the entire, all the choices you as a director or the editor would make the camera placement, how you move the camera through a scene, the pacing, the editing, the suspense you can or can't. But I think that's why a lot of movies today, they don't, I don't feel anything. I don't feel suspense. I don't feel engaged. I'm bored a lot. Of time. And I think because the way they're shot, they think, Oh, cause we can show these big sweeping shots. Yeah, you can. But that I to quote the great Ian Malcolm, man. Yeah. Yeah. You could, uh, I guess I'm paraphrasing. But you didn't stop to think if you should. <laughs> Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I think that that's the thing. And so, like, I didn't absolutely love Alien Romulus like everyone else apparently did. But I, did, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. But one thing I'll give it credit for is because they use so much practical. Practical effects, yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, it affected how it was shot. So it did build suspense, I think, in, in a more tra- traditional way. And there are CGI effects in it. And when the, the ones that are used are fine and they're good. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with like any CGI. It's when that's it's an over-reliance on it. It's like anything else. Plus, I also yeah. seem to recall, weren't we all told the reason why they wanted to come up with CGI is yeah. because it was going to cut down the price and the expense of, of effects. And, and we need a lot fewer people to make these things. I don't know last time you sat through the end credits of a flipping Marvel movie or some nonsense. 20 minutes. Oh my God. It's like a hundred thousand people. Now good for them. They got a job. They got job security, I guess, but it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You could have a crew of 10 people who knew what they were doing with practical effects. And no, would you have been able to show every little thing you showed? No, but the question becomes is doesn't mean you should You make a better movie. Yeah. You make a better movie. Definitely make people use your imagination, so, man. In other words, you're saying you're a huge fan of CGI. What I'm saying is, I am I am fine with CGI if it's there to enhance the real world stuff. But if you're yeah. that's why I, I honestly I'm I'm gonna be ready. I'm my hot take. I think AI is total bullshit, and I do not think it's gonna replace movies. I don't think so. Now, will there be a place for no. people to use it? Sure, but it's a novelty item. It is a freaking gimmick that people will get real bored with real fast because it's not creative. There's real creative process to that for me to go push a button or type in a prompt. What is that? That's not filmmaking. That's not yep. filmmaking. I don't know what the hell that is. Hey, filmmaking. So it'll be filmmakers who make real movies, and then there'll be people who go, I'm making props. Have fun with that. Not me, bro. Until, until Cyberdyne Systems takes over. And, and then uh, I'll be out living in a cabin in the woods and off the grids. I don't give a shit. They can do what they want to do then. Oh, uh, man, I just moved. Or I'll be dead or whatever. Either way, I, I don't moved, care. Moved up here into the mountains in Tennessee. That's so beautiful, dude. I love that. Western North Carolina, in a tennis, that whole Appalachian. Oh, it's so beautiful. I, I, I moved Carolina. into the uh, the Cumberland Mountains. It's kind oh, of a okay. smack in the middle of Nashville and Knoxville. Mm. And it, it when, I, when, I go, when we have to go to town, it takes us a half an hour to get to town. Uh, see, that's, that's, so, that, that sounds more and more appealing to me every single day. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. You oh, yeah. Night, all you hear is crickets and it, tree frogs people, and cicadas. and People across the road from us which is like a mile away. They have cows. Okay. So you'll yeah. hear moo. You'll hear the moo sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Like this morning I woke up and there was a cow in our front yard. I'm like, <laughs> why not? Okay. Free milk. It beats, it beats having a homeless guy in your front yard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or, or yeah. Or, 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 or you're, uh, I'm trying to think of like I, I I'm not technically, I'm not like a big city or anything. I mean, I'm still in a nice, I, I, I consider where I'm at like a big, small town. Yeah. <laughs> so, so so it, but it so it still has this but it's of course growing like exponentially just due to the fact that everybody and their freaking brother is moving to this area but uh but yeah no i i my my, my wife and i and i've had many conversations of like all right so land <laughs> in or near the mountains <laughs> oh yeah you know it's, it's it's wonderful yeah i don't know if you watch clarkson's farms but we we watch that i love that show on oh, Amazon. No. it's great it, you love it it's great and uh clarkson's farm and it, it's a uh jeremy clarkson's a british I, I i don't know that much about him other than i know he is a, a guy he, he does a top gear show it's about cars i know he's yeah. like he's a he's a he was on the who wants to be a millionaire i guess he was their original host in britain so Basically, though, it, he owns like a thousand acre farm and decides and it, like he's pushing 60. Like, hey, I think I'll become a full time farmer. <laughs> and so but right. my kids, my kids have watched it now. They're like growing vegetables out back. <laughs> and hey, I was like, hey, there's worse things you could want to do, man. We just had we just had fresh green peppers. It's good. That's yeah, so my my daughter. She's nine and she's been bugging me for years about wanting to have chickens. Yeah. Guess what? We can uh, well, have now. See, see yeah, the problem is when you live in a flipping HOA like I do, I can't. So that's one of the things we've talked about. It's like this is the last HOA for me, man. I, I'd like to have some chicken. I here's the thing. I I don't know. I, I couldn't. I don't think I could be one of these people that have like cows and stuff, and then like because I I would name them. <laughs> Same with pigs. Well, the pigs seem like they'd be a nightmare to have anyway. But I could yeah. see myself having so a couple like a, a milking cow or some goats, chickens for all the eggs, grow your own vegetables. Yeah, you know that kind of thing. Oh, I, I'm not gonna lie. The older I get, the more appealing that is to me. <laughs> yeah, it's very. It was appealing when I found this place. I was like, sign me up. I'm yeah, there. yeah, indeed. But uh, back, yeah, back to the movie at hand. Movie <laughs> now, uh, the di- the dynamic between Caleb and Jesse. Mm-hmm. Um, even though at the at beginning, Jesse is like, no. He gives him that one chance, yeah, uh, to, to prove to us, and, and then he fails. 
Um, and then he's like, no, you're done. Yep. But it's, it's, it is almost like a father son dynamic. Yes. You know, um, even, even after, even after Caleb saves them, Jesse's just, it's like, all right, you gotta, you gotta reprieve for now. Yeah. You know, it's for now. Yeah. You know, until the next time you mess up and I got to discipline you. Yeah. Kind of deal. That was interesting. Yeah, it it um, was, and it also back to. So I've been, we we homeschool our kids. I, I anyone who listens to this is not familiar with me. Like at this at this point, apparently I'm going to go live off grid in the mountains. I homeschool my children. <laughs> Nothing wrong. We're, we're we're those people. Um. So, join the club. Yeah, yeah. So so the um. Uh, uh, the the thing that I lo- I've been working with, the reason I bring all that up was to say my kids are doing like a video productions type class, and we've been discussing like screenwriting and storytelling. And there's a great video if you've never seen it. It's Parker and Stone of South Park fame, and it's they're in like a a college class teaching these writers their process for South Park of how they come up with stories. And it's a concept that once you you see it and you get it and you start apply, like watching stuff, you'll see like the best stories, the best movies you love, where it's in in effect. And he, they call it therefore, but. But I think you could also say because, but. Oh yeah. So for instance, you know this uh, C- Caleb sees this pretty girl, right? And he starts talking to her, and because he finds her so interesting and she seems interested in him. He asked, Hey, you want to go for a ride with me? And because Caleb isn't that threatening. And because, you know, because we know she's a vampire. So she ain't scared. She's looking for food because of that. She agrees to go with him. And then and, and because of this, you know, that leads to them doing this activity and because of that leads to this. And then, but she knows the sun's coming up, right? Obstacle, you know, it's, and it, so they talk about like how, if you watch an episode of South park, they follow that. That's why they feel like this coherent story of this happens. Therefore, this thing happens. Therefore, this happens. But, oh, now we're in a new direction. And if you think about that moment where Caleb's a dead man, like Jesse's already determined. They're, and Severin's just happy because he just wants to, he's wanted to kill him since he met him, right? <laughs> and, th- but he steps up and is not only doesn't just save that like he really say that because that if memory serves that's when he runs in broad daylight and ca- it's an awesome effect by the way yeah. you know, yeah you, and by the way here's where C- cgi would help because there's a couple of quick moments where you could totally see it's a stunt man if you pay because i've seen it enough where you could see like the the mask on him you know and the gloves yeah if you could go back and fix that like that that to me is like have it be a stunt man with real fire like they did because it, it creates this realness to it right this this is it's organic. It's it's real. It's raw, and then just enhance it. With the CGI, Enhan- like Forrest Gump, enhance. Don't over rely. And yeah. so, but but that whole sequence feels real because it makes sense that there, he's a dead man. Like, and I feel like in a lesser story, they would ever they would just be like, okay, we're gonna give you one more chance, da da da, because you know. No reason, really, just because yeah. we decided to. This, it's like, no, he earns his chance. Like he, yeah, he that does. doesn't. He, but you don't go against his character by him killing somebody to earn it, because he's that's not who he is. Oh, yeah. And you know, you don't want him to become that. That's the whole point of the movie. Is but he stays away from that the whole way through, and he manages to hold on that little thread of humanity, even though towards the end he's willing to. You think he's willing to finally do it until it's his dad and his sister, which is why they had to be. It's everything feels even yeah. look. Every movie, every story is contrived. Every one of them. It's all made up bullshit. A hundred percent. Everyone. I don't care what you're talking about, Citizen Kane, or you're talking about friggin' Raiders of Lost Ark, which d- depending on my mood is the greatest movie of all time. I don't care what it is. It's all bullshit, right? It's made really cool one, right? What's that? The Crystal Skull Raiders. Okay, or- listen, listen to me, man. I love you, Damon, but I will fight you. I probably will lose, but I will fight you. <laughs> oh, I can't you. It, it, it is not Crystal Skull. No, God, that doesn't even that movie doesn't exist. I don't give a what you're talking about. There's three <laughs> Indiana Jones movies, just yep. three. So <laughs> the um, but all of it's bullshit, right? It's all contrived. It's all yep. some writer said. Well, this is gonna happen, and then this, but it wasn't. This, and that's the other thing Parker should talk about. They said like lesser stories go, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, this happens, then this. but there's never a sense of like the stakes going higher and things going sideways. And that's what great stories do. Like if you ever watch Breaking Bad, oh, or yes. there's a 
there's a show I've been getting into, and a quick shout out to my buddy uh, uh, D- Dave <laughs> and, and my buddy Rick, because they told me both of them separately. They were like, "You got to watch the show." Have you seen The Bear on Hulu? It's about a it's about a restaurant in Chicago. It's this little like starts off with like this kind of greasy spoon diner in Chicago, and it's very simple. It's about family, and it's about these people r- working in this restaurant. Holy crap! Is the writing good? It, 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 it's the writing. It's yeah. like it's got a great people. At, um, John Bernthal, The Punisher, and oh, yeah. Shane Frog. He's got a small part in it, but he's in it. Jay, uh, Jamie Curtis is in it again. Not a major part, but she's in it. Um, uh, Bob Odenkirk from uh, uh, Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad is in it. Oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head the people that everyone would know immediately. But there, it's a great cast, dude. Great cast. But the the right they never explain. It's one of those moot shows where you've got to like really be paying attention because some character will just say something, and then like two episodes later, that will tie in. And if you were paying attention, you'd be like, "Oh my god, that's cool!" Like how yeah. they they made this little moment. And, check that out. And they never, they never explain stuff. Like that's the thing is I exposition is sometimes necessary. And I've got many movies I love that have heavy handed exposition, but it's the difference between exposition to show something about these characters or this world versus, Hey audience, we think you're stupid. So we're going to have this character explain to this other character, but what we're really doing is explaining it to you because we couldn't find a better way to get this information across. Right. And what I feel like near dark does exceptionally well is it never explains we get those hints. Jesse making a reference to the Civil War, but he never says Civil War. Yeah. He says, I fought for the South. We lost. <laughs> so I think we can determine, right, where he came from. Um, all of them, you know, you get hints as to who turned who, but they don't ever over explain it. They also never say the word vampire. Like to your point, there's nothing other than the sun. And it's almost more like an allergy to the sun than it is actual, like you just turn into a um, poof. You just, no, it's not like, you, you know, if you get yourself covered, you're fine. Nice. Yeah, so yeah, but even like that, him running that whole sequence, and that was a visual effect circa 1987, so it's not perfect. But I'll say for a pre CGI fire effect on a where you're still showing the actor's face, I thought that That's was actually good. pretty damn good. Pretty good, yeah. And we do get that story too, you know. You, well, you don't get the story, uh, you get uh, where Diamondback is like, uh, they were passing, they were driving, they're passing that car, and she's like, oh, that reminds me of uh, you know, when you pulled over to help me. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it leads you to that's when he turned her. You're like, oh, do you remember that? They By start the way, talking about how long ago it was and they can't remember really or something yes. like that. Yeah, but, that's, but that, all they got to do is say, I don't even remember how long ago. I don't remember. Like, oh, oh, so long ago. I can't even remember. It's like, well, we know. I mean, if he's from the Civil War yeah. yep. <laughs> and he turned her, now Carr was involved. So it was, but it probably could have been the 30s, could have been the 40s. I, you know, yeah, who knows? And, and that's what's so cool about the movie is that there's these like hints. You get a hint of, this world, this bigger world and all these other stories like where you could find things out. You could. And the problem is nowadays, it's like somebody would want to fill in all those gaps for us and they would want to do prequels. And so let's see where Jesse and Diamond back. Right? Nobody wants you to do that, dude. It's more yeah. fun for us to film. It's like when, as soon as they, you know, in original Star Wars and Yoda says, you know, the, what was there? The, the, they reference the Clone Wars, right? The original Star Wars. Yeah. But all of us as kids were like, what the hell is a Clone, what's a Clone War? What's that? And so your imagination's going. And we would talk to our friends about it. We'd be filling in the gaps. But then the they had to make a cartoon. Yeah. And, and, and then, and you know, look, and I know some people love that car. I never watched it. My kids love it. I can appreciate what they did with it. Because at least with that, I think they were still trying to tell some good stories. It was before Disney got a hold of this damn thing and effed it up. But that's a whole other thing. Uh, but, I and honestly, my appreciation for the prequels has... I've gotten softer on them over the years, mainly because of all the Disney crap. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah, so I've gotten that way too. Yeah, um, but, I'm a, but I'm a huge fan of Disney. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but the problem is because the writing's all garbage. So it's at yep. the end of the day, for me, all of it comes down to writing, and, and writing is the one thing. It's like the hardest thing. It's also the cheapest thing for you to do because you don't. I mean, yes, you got to pay your writer, but it's not like you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on the front end for the writer. You you pay somebody, or you pay a, a team of people, and it's and if you got a great script, man, you're off to the races. And oh, yeah. and, and, and so I think though the those hints of things in the original Star Wars is what made it become so just part of everything. It became part of everything for all of us. It was so ingrained in the culture because there was just hints of things like who Yoda was when he was, you know, a Jedi master and who this character was. We didn't ever see it. We didn't know about it. 
And I was personally fine with that. Like, I don't need to. I like the fill in the, like what we talked about earlier. It's imagination and filling in the gaps. And what I love about Near Dark is I feel like it does that. And the more you watch it, the more you can appreciate that. And the one thing we didn't get to was the freaking score by Tangerine Dream. I love the score, Dude. man. Yeah. And I didn't, that's something that I, I didn't really think about until I was doing research on it. And I had to go back and listen to some of the score. Yeah. So I was like, that is, it was, it was, it was good. Yeah, it's really good. Tangerine Dream is one of those groups that did a lot of 80s synth scores. And like everyone always goes to Carpenter, right? Car Look, I love Carpenter's scores, right? Some of them are completely iconic and they're amazing. But Tangerine Dream, like, because I think they did what Risky Business, Sorcerer, if you've ever seen that with Roy Scheider, the way you freaking film. Um, I think it was at Miracle Mile. I'm pretty sure they did the one for that. I mean, there's a lot of these like smaller movies that don't get, I think that's maybe why they don't get talked about as much with their scores is because a lot of the movies they did were for these smaller films or movies that didn't do that great at the time where they yeah. become cult films. But damn, you go back and just listen to the freaking score for Sorcerer or the score for this and just the music. It is so good, dude. It's so good. Yep. I'm definitely going to have to give this movie another watch. Yeah. And, and this, is what, this is one of the things I like doing this. Yeah. Um, because I watch a movie, mm -hmm. especially if it's one that I haven't seen before. And I watch it one time. I get kind of, um, you know, my viewpoint on it. Yeah. Uh, as it, but then after talking it out with people, you you're like, oh, I need to rewatch it now. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I love that too. I love that. Too. I love talking about, especially it's one I've never seen before. I like to have it's not it's not that you're trying to like be swayed one way or the other. Like you know, especially if you like hated something or loved it. It's not like so we can talk you out of it. Although I guess. People can start pointing out enough flaws or something you love where you're like, you know, I didn't think about that. <laughs> but yeah. but then again, sometimes you just love it because you love it. And vice versa, you may have just didn't work for you. You know, whatever somebody's like telling you, like, oh, like I've had debates with people where they would, I'm just yeah. gonna randomly pull this out of my butt. So I apologize. <laughs> you you know who you are if you're listening to this, but like Rise of Skywalker. I'm sorry, I think that movie is utter garbage, it's horrible writing, it's it's freaking lazy as hell. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's lazy it was storytelling. Not, I mean, obviously, the people who put the work in to make the movie, I give you guys credit, but every, every anything else about that movie to me is totally lazy. Yep. It, it, it follows that this happens and this happens and this happens. No, no, therefore, buts, none of that. But I know some people who really like that movie. And I, I mean, who am I to say, bro, then good for you. I'm happy. Like, I wish. I could have had the response you did. Because believe me, I did not go into any movie, let alone a Star Wars movie, wanting to hate it. Like, that's yep. the last thing I wanted. And that's what I feel about, you know, the bulk of the uh, the MCU movies that have come out yeah. since, since Infinity War. Mm -hmm. um, you know, terrible writing. You know, they opened up this multiverse thing, and that's lazy. Yeah, um, I've always thought that this whole multiverse aspect of movies or storytelling is lazy. Yep. You can't it's, come up with an idea or a concept. It's a cop-out. Yeah, you can't come up with an idea or a concept. So you're just like, ah, it's a, it's a different it's a different universe. Yeah. yeah. It's just character about a different universe. Yeah. Boy, you know who started crazy. that? You know who started that, really? At the time, I thought it was smart because I hadn't heard of somebody doing this before. J.J. Abrams, not shocking, with Star Trek. Because remember, in oh, that yeah. or Star Trek movie, Little Nimoy as Spock shows up. And that was their way to make the fans of the OG feel yeah. like not annoyed that they'd replaced Shatner with Pine and and, yep. and, and, and Nimoy with uh, the guy from Nosferatu and Heroes. I'm brain farting on his name. Oh God! What yeah, Zachary, Zachary Quinto, right? He's the one that played. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he's a great. They're great actors, but because they were so, I think probably and rightfully so, afraid about all the comparisons that were going to be made. I think that that was the logic, and at the time, it did seem original. The problem is, I think what Hollywood did took that lesson from that was, hey, this is how we could circumvent a lot of this stuff, and now we could have like an actor or a character come back. No matter, oh, oh, they're dead. No. They're not really dead. This is the alternate version of them. And now said there's no stakes. It's sort of like yeah. the bigger you make this, like so. And once they, once the MCU started to make everything about the universe, dude, who can relate to that? You know, yeah. what you can relate to your city or your town or your neighborhood being under attack, or even your yeah. country. You can relate to. You are not going to friggin' relate to the whole world, even. I mean, that's about as much as I think our brains. We start going into galaxies and and, yeah. and somebody, somebody say, well, what about Star Wars? Yeah. Star Wars, yeah, they said they were in this galaxy and their empire over the galaxy, but you now you were always focused in on this core group of people, right? And you and, care about yeah, that's it. Simple. Yep. 
Simple but not easy. Not easy. <laughs> yeah, storytelling is definitely, definitely where it's at. Um, yeah. I'm gonna go and give this movie another watch here. Okay. Um, I, I, and it, I, I, I did. I'll tell you. We'll start this up. What are your feelings in the movie? Uh, oh, oh, near dark. Yeah, near dark. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one? Which one we talked about? Um, <laughs> I love, dude. I love it. Like, the several like, movies we've, we've we've discussed. Yeah, like I said, I feel for me, it is my favorite overall vampire. And I love Lost Boys. I love Fright Night. I love, I love, I love a lot of vampire movies. Actually, a lot. And I always think that vampires are not my one of my favorite things. But then I'll start going through all the list of vampire movies. I'm like, yeah. I like. There's there's very few vampire movies aside from Twilight that which because it just ain't for me, man. It was that yeah. was not a book a series nor a movie series designed for. My old ass. It was not for me. But that's fine. I've got the kids have their thing. I, on the other hand, though, when I go through all these movies, whether it's Interview with Vampire or Dracula, Ran Stoker's Dracula, all these are so good, dude. Like even, um, I don't know if you've ever seen, hold on, hold on. Let me back up. I know this one, where this one is. You remember when Fangoria films in the early 90s, they came up with like three movies. You remember Children of the Night? yeah. Yeah. On VHS, Dude. like as, as as low budge and cheesy in some ways, this movie was love it. I love it. Yeah. So I love, I do love vampire movies, but I think overall, I just there's something about Near Dark because it is so different than everything else, because it has the cast that it does, because it has the music it does, and there's there's certain just shots in it, like the like when they're coming up over that ridge and like the fog, and you see their silhouettes at first. Dude, it is badass on a, on another level. Or when little moments when Diamondback and Jesse are in the car and they get carjacked, oh, and those guys are like, "Oh!" and they're like, "They're they're they're acting like they're gonna I'm assault gonna her." Her. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and they just start laughing. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> "Woo! You you yeah, picked the wrong car." Hard. Yeah, and I gotta tell you, one thing that I really like about this is that it gives you that vampire story without telling you that they're vampires and it changes a lot of it up mm-hmm. um, because that's one of the things that to me has grown tiresome almost in, in vampire movies. It's just, it's the same stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, they got fangs, they gotta, they gotta be in their coffin. You know, they can't, you know, garlic crosses, all the stuff that the church is a uh, blah, blah, blah. There's always so much stuff, but it's the same across uh, most vampire movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you find something like this, that, um, that changes the it flips the script a little bit. It changes the the vamp, and that's one of the reasons why I like subspecies so much uh, yeah. from Full Moon. Um, it's it's different. It yeah. tells a different vampire story. Uh, it's not a rehash of the same, you know, vampire lore and everything like that. And I can get on board with that. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, yeah, so yeah. Definitely, I'm definitely going to revisit this movie again. Good, good. Do you do ratings? I don't remember. Do you do ratings? Uh, you can if you want. You got a rating? No, no. If you don't, if you don't do ratings, I'm fine with that because I actually kind of hate doing ratings. But I, I don't. Re- it's just a well, would you recommend it kind of deal? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, well, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I like the recommendation rating. That's my favorite kind. Yeah. Yes. Because like because like I, I could say it's a ten out of ten for for me. I realize it's not a perfect movie. Like I said, there's a couple of story things where you're like, all right, I'll go with it. Uh, but I just there's I love it so much and it's just it's I know, something about I, I, and i watch it every couple of years like you know it's a couple of years usually go by and i always feel like when i rewatch it i there's something i'd forgotten about even though it's not a very long movie i'm like oh that's right i forgot that, that, that was in this or i forgot that was his sister you know like that kind of thing which is cool when you revisit a movie and you're like oh that's right man yeah and you're just it always pulls me in and i just i love the tone of it i love the darkness of it and like honestly my biggest personal criticism and I, I think it's hilarious because I know like Daryl is to bust my balls. Like I'm Mr. Softy, you know, like, oh, I want everything to be. Uh, no, it's just, I the ending isn't remotely dark enough. Like I, I'm not saying the, yeah. the end with, you know, with everybody dying and like, no, you have to do that. But I just feel like if Caleb had been saved, but they just couldn't save May. Like, you know, what I mean, like no matter what he did, yeah, he couldn't have saved her. I think there's something to that. And like, she maybe walked into the sun or something. And, you know, I, I, I just feel like you could like a rogue one ending. That's a, of the, one of the few Disney star Wars things I actually like <laughs> that, that end. Cause the ending, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. yeah that, that, uh, I gotta say that whole blood transfusion thing kind of threw me off a little bit. How just yeah. say it's so easy to save a vampire. Just, you just empty the yeah. transfuser and I, it, okay. It makes sense. And I think even that idea was brought up in, in Dracula. Um, you know, 
to drain the blood out. And maybe where they got it from. Yeah, for all I know. Because I I don't know, and I am definitely not a medical professional, but I just the way they do that whole thing, I do not think SL blood transfusion would even work. Because number one, you got to have the right blood type. Now, his father transfusing into him, they might have the same blood type, so it'd be fine. But then again, his father's only going to have so much blood before he's going to die. So unless he's got like a stockpile of his own blood, which I, which brings up a whole other set of questions. Why do you stockpiling your own blood? But then where did they get the blood for her? How do they even know what her type? You know, you know what I'm saying? As soon as you yeah. open up that box, you're like, ah, that doesn't, that's yeah, no, why you do that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, I think uh, I could have, I could have done with a darker ending. Somebody dying. Yeah, something like that. A tra- like almost like a romantic tragedy because it's a yeah. romantic movie. There's it's definitely got a strong romantic element to it. Oh, yeah. It felt like it should be like a tragedy, like a Romeo and Juliet, rather oh, than yeah. like, oh, in the end, hey. Maybe <laughs> lives happily ever after. Yeah, right? yeah. That's not real life, Joel. Yeah, I know. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, but that's it. That is near dark uh from 1987. Both like the movie. Yep. Um Watch it if you get a chance. If you haven't seen it yet, well, I can't say too much because I didn't see it until yesterday. So. And and was it was it available streaming for you? I don't think it was, right? Um, ahoy, matey. Oh, oh, okay. I was gonna say, did did you know? Hypothetically, arg, did yeah. you have a hard time <laughs> procuring it? Ye, yeah. There you go. <laughs> ye, matey. <laughs> yeah. So. I ended up, I thought I owned it. Like, I mean, as much as I love it, you think I own it, right? And I, this version, this literal exact same, I had this forever. Like, when it was, this version came out in 2002. And I had it. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find, you think, I mean, I'm freaking got every, you know, a bunch of crap all around me. I'm like, and I, most of it's in alphabetical order. I'm looking, I'm like, why don't I have near dark? So I go to look. Dude, the Blu ray is like 50, 60 bucks or some nonsense. Yeah. Like, what the hell? Then it's not on streaming. So I'm starting to panic. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> um, and then I went on eBay and somebody sold this for like 10 or 15 bucks. It's a two disc. It's got, it's got a cool, like oh, wow. 47 minute documentary. I highly recommend this version too. You know, I mean, as long as you're fine with watching on DVD instead of Blu-ray, I'd buy the Blu-ray if they would come out with a new one. And it wasn't 50 bucks. So yeah. yeah. Well, I will definitely, I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump back. Cause I've been into collecting some physical media uh, recently too. And we one of the things that saved us because we first moved to the house we lived here for a week and a half with no internet Mm -hmm. um and if you go out to the front porch or the back porch you got like one bar (laughs) so the communication i mean we if if i hadn't started collecting physical media we would have been yeah twirling your thumbs yeah yeah you know so um we got a lot of vhs tapes a lot of dvds a lot of blue a lot of you know steel books and stuff so we got we got through it yeah it's important so of a physical media. Yeah, as long as you have electricity and or a generator, you will at least be entertained. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's all it takes. Yeah. Entertainment. There you go. That's it, Joel. Where's everybody going to find you at now? Well, obviously the mom and pop video shop on the YouTubes. Check that out, please. Uh, we put out a new movie recommendation every single Monday. And uh, we got Spooky Flicks Fest kicking off here in October. And we'll at least have something every Monday, Wednesday, and I think Friday. And then with all the bonuses and everything. Now, we're not going to fill up every single day of the week in October, but we will definitely do our usual ridiculous amount of stuff. Uh, and then that's the main stuff. And then, of course, Jay of the Dead's new horror movies. I'm on that from time to time. Uh, and I feel like I'm forgetting to watch a movie geek, but we haven't been doing that lately. So I think that's pretty much it at the moment. Oh, 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 oh my God, Tarot the Tube. But see, I think because we do that now on Mom and Pop Video Shop, like I just, I lumped the two together. Right? Yeah. Tear on the two, Peter. I'm sorry, Allison. I'm sorry. How can I forget that? Yeah, I actually, so I actually like that. And there's some when you guys discuss these mo- these t- made for TV movies, I'm like, that sounds actually kind of good. I'm some of them are, it. and then some of them star uh, uh, Susan Lucci. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. Uh, what some of them, most of them? Have you found a lot of them that are done by horror hosts on YouTube? Oh yeah. So creature features. Feature say, feature. Yeah, they're great. They're out of uh, San Francisco, which is it's a it, creature features. The show is actually one of the OG like horror host shows, along with like guys like I don't think they're as old as Zachary. You know, definitely not as old as Zachary, but Zachary and Goulardi and the Ghoul and Doctor Paul Bear. If you know about it, Doc, uh, Count Gore Duvall, all those like kind of OG horror hosts, sixties, seventies, especially. Um, John Stanley was the host of the original creature features out of Northern California. And now 
It's hosted by, they've got three hosts that are great. Uh, uh, Vincent uh, Tangella and, and uh, Mr. Livingston, the butler, who is fantastic. Um, and it, it's on YouTube. I think they have like a, like a streaming, like they have an app. And obviously if you're in that area, you could just watch them on your, on your TV, but, uh, but highly recommend they got, a, they got like hundreds and hundreds of episodes and they're fun. And they, you know, yeah, they do the whole horror host shtick. Yeah. So a lot of the ones we cover are That's the reason that. why I like Joe Bob Briggs so much. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And exactly. I love that stuff. Yeah, me too. Love 100%. It. But that's it. That's it for this episode of Guess What? You're Wrong. Joel, I got to thank you for hopping in here. Thank you, man. Thank you for having time. me. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to the next time. Yeah, me too. We'll be next time. Indeed. I'll be hitting you up again All eventually. Right. <laughs> that's it, everybody out there. Sweet dreams. Have a good night. Love, peace, and chicken grease. And that's going to do it for the day. Thanks for hanging out with me and letting me bend your ear for a while. Ain't no time for bad shine. (laughs) And until next time, don't forget. (laughs) You're wrong. Later, Tater. This concludes our broadcast day. Good night and God bless America.